National Park. You know, with the war going crazy here in the summer of 1941 and war with the Japanese Imperial government on the horizon, it sure is good to see all of you people out here enjoy, enjoying the outdoors and getting away from the troubles of everyday life. Now, let me ask you, why did you come to Mount McKinley? <laughs> see, you see it? See a bear? You might. Is any part of the mountain out now? Just a little bit? That counts. <laughs> what brought me here was actually a park service exchange. They brought me up here a couple months ago in June from Glacier National Park. I said a ranger that was here down the glacier. My job here is a wildlife ranger, so I observe and assess the wildlife and also assist Dr. Adolph Murray with his studies. Now, largely speaking of the wildlife, this park was established to protect a specific mammal. Let me what that mammal is. All sheep. All right, yay driver. <laughs> Charles Sheldon was a naturalist who came here twice between 1906 and 1908 to study them. While he was here, he witnessed the commercial hunting, shall we actually say slaughter of the sheep, and envisioned this area turned into a preserve to protect them. And he shared that vision with Harry Carstens. And when Sheldon returned to the lower 48 states, he spent the next decade campaigning to have the area turned into a preserve. And all of his efforts <laughs> finally culminated with its creation in 1917. When Harry Carson came here as his first superintendent four years later, he was superintendent of a staff of one, himself. <laughs> he had 2.2 million acres to protect. But they did give him an annual salary of $10. <laughs> yes, I meant to say annual. <laughs> and a donation of $300 to get this park off the ground. Quite a daunting task for one man. He jumped right in, started patrolling this vast wilderness on foot and dog sled and all kinds of weather. Now, how many of you have been camping or hiking in different weather? Absolutely. Very few. What was the coldest you've ever been when you did that? 90. <laughs> minus 10? Is that 90 below? Anybody below minus 10? How far? You definitely know where I'm going with this. As I said, I was a ranger down in Glacier. It's pretty cold there throughout the winter. Mercury sometimes dips below zero. There's uh, snow on the ground throughout the winter, six feet at the lower elevations and 12 feet at the higher elevations. There's a lot of patrols on skis, snowshoes, snow machine. Since I got up here, they've told me that it does not prepare me for what I'm going to have to deal with here this winter. Mm -hmm. Here they've got blinding snowstorms, hurricane force winds, Sub-zero temperatures down to minus 40, sometimes minus 60 degrees. Frostbite and hypothermia are going to be two things I need to be careful of. Because if something happens out here, mistake, mishap, there's nobody out here to help me. Could mean death. It's also a term they told me to keep fresh in my mind. Has anybody heard of 30-30-30? I hadn't either. <laughs> what it means is a negative 30 degrees and a 30 mile per hour wind any exposed skin has only 30 seconds before it'll freeze. Those are the conditions Harry Carson started patrolling this park in, alone. It'd be a few months before he was able to hire some more rangers to help him out. But it'd be two years before they had any type of shelter on their patrols, besides the spruce tree and the dog teams for warmth. In 1923, the Alaska Road Commission started work on the park road. Every 12 to 15 miles, they built cookhouses for the road crews. They used them during the summer. And the Park Service started using them in the winter as stopovers for their patrols. Thank God. <laughs> the cabin you see in front of you, Savage Cabin, is one of those cookhouses. It was built in 1924. It was located about a mile southwest of here. It was constructed as a double cabin. The other half would be where you're standing. And the Park Service moved it here just last summer in 1940. Unfortunately, they dismantled your half and used it for firewood. <laughs> but it is the oldest still in use cabin in the park. While not quite a resort cabin by today's standards, it does give us protection from the elements. When we get here at Cabino Patrol, first thing we have to do is take care of the dogs. And that includes putting them on a gang line outside. See, the sled dog does not want in there with that wood stove. Because their comfortable temperature range is 40 down to negative 40 degrees. They love it in the snow. After that's done, we can go inside, get that wood stove going, put some food on, make some coffee, maybe read a book or magazine that another ranger's left. I love to read, but after a while, that gets old, too. Luckily, I have wildlife reports to uh, fight the boredom with. Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. I like watching the wildlife and taking my own notes, but those uh, reports are tedious. 
The patrols out here can last two to three weeks at a time, usually done solo. And I know from my patrols at Glacier, the isolation can really push a man to mental and physical breaking points. When I started talking, I mentioned a man by the name of Dr. Adolf Murray. Does anybody know who he is? See a head nodding over there. I've heard of him. <laughs> biologist over here? You know what he studies? Bell sheep. Okay. Not small. Not that small. Who said wolf? Wolf, you win. He originally came here in the 1920s with his older brother Olaf, who was doing a study on the caribou. And with him helping him here, that inspired him to become a wildlife biologist himself and also work for the Park Service. They sent him here in 1939 to study the wolf and the impact it might be having on the animals it hunted. To the opinion of a lot of people, and I was guilty of the same thing, is that predators have a negative impact on the populations of other animals. Well, since he got here, he's traveled over a thousand miles in the park so far in all kinds of weather on foot and dog sled. Spent countless hours observing the wolf and dissecting scat. That sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. He's not quite ready to divulge his conclusions to the Park Service, but I know where he's going with them. From everything I've seen myself and the reports I've read, wolves do not have a negative impact. In fact, the predator-prey relationship actually balances itself out. This is not going to make him very popular with the Park Service because I know it is not the result they were looking for right now. But another thing that he has done since he got here, at least in my own mind, and hopefully in the minds of others when they see the facts in front of them, is he has dispelled the myth that we as humans have anything to fear from a wolf. As a prime example, he shared the following with me over dinner one night. He walked out of the East Fork Patrol cabin, a cup of coffee in hand, looking out at the morning view. He looked out and he saw fresh wolf tracks in the snow right off the porch. So he went inside, put the coffee down, grabbed his notebook to go out and follow them. Right then I should have known where this story was going, because nobody in their right mind leaves a full cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> he goes out and he follows his tracks up about a mile from the cabin. And he stumbles upon a male wolf, literally. Startled both of them. He said the wolf jumped up, ran off nearby to start barking and howling at him. Andy would have gone back to the cabin at that point. <laughs> and not Dr. Murray. He goes a little bit further. He finds an opening to their den in the ground. As they stood three feet away from it, the female stuck her head out, going back inside, and she ran out right past him to join the male, also barking alley at him. At that point in time, Andy definitely would have gone back to the cabin. <laughs> he said he got down on his hands and knees and looked in this hole. Then he leaned across the table, smiling real big, eyes about as big as half dollars, and he goes, Andy, I cannot resist doing what I did next. Oh, no, you did not. He said, yes, I did. He crawled inside that den. <laughs> Who would do that? <laughs> I told him he was nuts. He said, wait, it gets better. He crawls all the way to the back of the den, and he finds six small wolf pups. I was guessing that he was guessing that they were about a week old, but he said he needed light. No. So he scooped up three of them, oh my backed God. out of them, out of the den with them to examine them in the daylight. I told him he had lost his mind. But it wasn't what happened next that was so noteworthy. It's what did not happen. As he stood there holding and examining those pups, the parents never approached him, never threatened him in any manner. He put them back in the den and walked away. Only then did they return. Doesn't sound like any legends or Grimm's fairy tales, does it? So what does Dr. Adolph Murray have to do with this cabin? One of the longest trips he's gone on here, he went out to Wonder Lake in the base of Mount McKinley. This is the first cabin he stayed in on his way out there. It's the last cabin he stayed in coming back to the east side of the park. So for him to have shared his love of wolves with me, and for me to have gone with him quite often over the last two months, it means a lot to me not only to be able to stand on this porch and say I know for a fact I'm standing where Adolph Murray stood, but also that I'm honored to have walked with him in this park. Now, the early rangers of this park laid the foundation to protect it for us, our generation. People like Murray are beginning to open up our minds to understand the ecology and behavior of the animals that live here. Myself and other rangers here today protect and preserve for future generations. And we still do patrols by dog sled during the winter here and stay in all these old cabins and stopover points. I'll get my first exposure to that this winter. Hopefully. There's a rumor going around that Superintendent Bean's going to make us do foot patrols. I hope not. 
And as each of you go home, I'm sure there's some place near where you live that needs to be protected. I urge you to get involved. It doesn't matter how little of an effect you think you might make. One person can make a difference. Just ask Charles Sheldon, Harry Carstens, or Dr. Adolf Murray. In a moment, I'll open up the door so you can take a look inside before I have to head out here, uh, head out of here and meet Dr. Murray. But feel free to ask questions, take pictures. I need to warn you about the nails where the window and shutter on this side. They point out, since it was built as a cookhouse, and we're still cooking it now when we're here, the aromas tend to attract wildlife, especially bear. So that deters them from trying to come through the window for the food. But before I open the door, I'll leave you with one last thought. It's from the Cree Indians of Canada. The trees have all been cut, and the animals have all been hunted. When the water has all been polluted, and the air is no longer safe to breathe. Only then will we realize that we cannot eat money. Thank you.